Welcome on stage, Søren Grundtoft Johansen. Hi, you guys. And you see I have a limp. I uh, was on the football pitch on Saturday. Uh, coaching my son's team, and we have this guy um, called Big Albert. He's, he's nine, so he's actually not that big. But we trained him really well, because he's not pulling out of a tackle. So I'm going to be struggling with this for six weeks. If I keel over, help me up, because I can't do it myself, yeah? All right. <clears throat> Let's see if I can work this. So as mentioned, my name is Sean, and um, as it's a Scandinavian crowd, this I reckon, so you would recognize some of you at least. The uh, I struggle with it when I visit uh, abroad, especially in airports, where I like coffee a lot. So whenever I hit uh, Starbucks, they struggle with the uh. And you all seen all the cups with the funny names on it and stuff like that, right? But I think I've come up with how they do it. Because what they do is they, they take your sounds that come out of your mouth, and they associate it to what they see. So their perspective of you becomes your name on the cup. And that makes sense. <laughs> Dark, mysterious, superhero-like with a cape, Latin. I thought I was the only one who thought I looked a little bit Latin, but the girl in Starbucks did as well. Still dark, mysterious, very masculine, influential. All seeing, love that one. But this guy loves jewelry, and I'm not too much into that. And my favorite, my personal favorite, <laughs> it's uh, the Eastern European ex elite soldier hairdresser super lover. Yeah, I'm not Eastern European though. All right. Enough about me, a little bit about Bestseller. So, uh, Bestseller was founded in 75. You heard a little bit of the key numbers, so I'm going to repeat a couple of them. And uh, we, were found, we were founded by the father of our current uh, uh, CEO. Now, um, we run um, retail, we run wholesale, we run e-commerce, we run basically all of our brands. And all of our brands, I stopped counting at 25. This is the latest slide. I can at least name two that are not here. And there's also one which is uh, in the slide, but not really out there anymore. You know a couple of them. The guys might know Selected, Jack and Jones. The girls may know Vermuda, Only, Vila, Selected perhaps as well. But we're a brand factory in many ways. We generate brands, and we're pretty good at it. So. We are um, in 38 markets with 3,000 retail stores. And those are the branded retail stores. When I say branded retail stores, they're the ones that says Jack and Jones at the top or Vermuda at the top. We have 3,000 of those. We, have, we sell to 15,000 uh, stores. Those are department stores. Those are multi-brand stores via wholesale. And we do that in 53 markets. So hold on to a couple of numbers here, right? Hold on to the 3,000 branded stores, hold on to 38 markets, and hold on to 25 brands. I'll get back to that in just a sec. Because I need to talk a little bit about our culture, and you can probably tell, but this is not a corporate slide. This is me interpreting how the culture is in bestseller. And we, we are very entrepreneurial. We thrive with engagement. We thrive with ownership. We love silos. We love nearness. And, if I may add, we have all possible ownership models. We have franchise. We have semi-owned. We have internal partners, external partners, fully owned, not owned at all, joint ventures. These 3,000 stores, 
they are owned in a host of ways. We have probably have any new ones out there. So coming back to the um, numbers, because I'm going to put this into a little bit of an omni-channel perspective. Because imagine 38 countries in a matrix with 25 brands, and then you scatter 3,000 stores into that matrix, and then you tell the guy who owns the only store in Netherlands that he can decide prices, assortment, when the sales start, when the season changes, anything he needs to run his store. That, per definition, is an omnichannel nightmare. In fact, if you look up omnichannel nightmare on Wiki, you'll see this is it. It is so tricky. And I'm not saying this because it's bestseller, because you would have a lot of players out there that work in a franchise basis that will have all these problems. And what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about three very, very simple ways, cheap, that can be done by all, almost anyone who runs e-commerce and retail at a reasonably low price that will make an immense change to the organization. And many have done already. So let me get cracking on that. What we did as the first go is we launched, like almost any other retailer you would know of, with e-commerce, would launch Click and Collect. Why would we do that? It's the simplest possible proposition you can do, omnichannel-wise. You simply change the address of the parcel from home delivery to delivery in store, and you change your store operations manual, and you have Click and Collect. And the customers get it, because they, they get reasonably cheap pricing. I need to talk to Bring and Portnor, so help me remember that. So simple, simple proposition. Simple, simple to implement. And that's what we did. Now, I was really struggling when I started with Click and Collect. Actually, I was a little bit worried if I had a job in half a year. I was wondering. Is the organization ready for this? Can I persuade the guys in the stores? So what I did was I launched Click and Collect, and I said, I do this exclusively to test if the organization is ready. So I said, we have 250 stores in Denmark. So I said, if I can get 100 stores on board, I'm good. I have a job. I'm in for the long haul. If I cannot get 100 stores on board, I'm out. I resign. So. We asked everyone. We made, we made it a voluntary setup. Everyone could join. They could step in with two weeks' notice, and they could step out with two weeks' notice. And we had 150 stores in. So I was in. I was successful right there. But still, 150 stores out of 250 on a risk-free proposition, I didn't get it. It was odd. It worked out for the better, I have to say. And now we have 225 stores in in Denmark. We have 1,500 stores in in Europe, so it worked out. But when I'm standing here talking about this, perhaps you are thinking, didn't you do this for the customer's sake? Wasn't it, wasn't it because the customer experience was better that way? Not for me. We think rather customer-centric. That's in our culture. But I have to say, if I'm not keeping a keen eye on the organizational readiness, at least where I work, then I will fail for sure, regardless what the customer says. So that change that happened with Click and Collect slowly, but surely, over more than a year, that was immense. And that was what triggered me to work on the next thing coming. But let's be, let's be fair, Click and Collect, I don't know if some of you probably tried it. It's not saving the index figures of retail. It's just not. And I know, because after building generation three and four of Click and Collect, we have tracking on every single upsell that we do on Click and Collect. So meanwhile, we were doing click and collect. We were also doing returns. And returns, that is inherently the most difficult proposition for a non-vertically integrated retailer. For someone who does not own their own stores, that is very difficult to do. But the, the funny part is that that's where some of the money is. Because think about this. You buy a pair of jeans 
Oh, there's a lot of guys here. You buy a pair of jeans, and it's a guy thing because girls would buy six pairs of jeans and return all of them. But you buy one pair of jeans, and you ship it back, back to online, right? Buy a mail. How many would go out and buy something from the same web shop one or two days later? Almost none. And I know that because we checked it. There's a very low percentage that buys within very short period after returning. But what happens if you return that product, for instance, your pair of jeans, to a store? The guy you meet behind the counter, he's recruited, profiled, trained, incentivized to sell you jeans. Unless you have three legs, he will sell you a pair of jeans. So, of course, there's a rather large upsell, or if you can coin it upsell, we coin it upsell. And that's the difference. The difference how many buys again after returning online and how many buys when they go to the store. And that's, for us at least, a very large portion of money. And if you do it right, you even have the customer do the hard part, the return logistics bid. You actually get the customer to return the product to a place where it's resellable. You can wrap it up, put it on the shelf, good to go. So returns, that's where the money is, or at least a portion of the money on, on Omnichannel. So why is it hard? It should be easy, right? Well, some of you know that there are very, very deep trenches between retail and online. I at least know when I talk to partners and uh, store people in my network, they see you guys, most of you guys, the e-commerce players, you have horns, right? You're the evil one himself. They, you guys steal all the, uh, the revenue from the stores. That's how they perceive it. So sometimes, if I'm not very clear toward the store and to the store owner, that they make a fortune on taking a return, they will simply not do it. But I have yet to try and sit with a partner and talk about this and not be able to convince that partner that there's money in returns. So showing the figures, showing the return on investment, showing how many customers walk in the door on the upsell frequency, that's the trick to doing returns, and that's the trick to reaping some of the benefits in Omnichannel. Now, I said customer centricity. Now, customer centricity for us is very important. We look at it every day, but in many ways, what we are doing the customer expects even more. We can, do, we can work the next year with things that the customers are just ready for. I don't, I don't have to ask them. I don't have to check if they really would like to be able to return a Vermota product bought on vermota.dc to a Vermota store. Of course they do. So we can just do this stuff, and I can focus on the organization. And a lot of my organization have been talking about loyalty. And I know every retail out there have either, either tried it or working hard on uh, finding loyalty as the next holy grail of retail. I'm struggling. I'm really struggling with that. Probably it's a good idea, but I've also seen quite a lot of uh, loyalty schemes fail. So what we did at some point, we had a choice. Either we needed to do a full-on loyalty scheme, customer club, whatever you want to call it, or we would do the smallest possible thing we could even think of. And I was really, I was 50-50. If, if I had spoken to the right guy at the right time, I would have turned over right away and done the opposite. But what we did was we did the smallest possible loyalty scheme we could think of. It's the same thing I do in my local coffee shop when I get a stamp every time I do a cup of coffee. It's simple. It's flexible. We spun it up in less than a month. It's in the app. We get a permission. We get an app download, and it costs almost nothing. So in a silent moment just before we launched, I thought, should I go all in instead? Should I really do the big thing with points and affiliated companies and blah, blah, blah? And I said, no, let's, let's do it. Let's do the little, bit, a little small stamp card. And we, did, we launched it, and we had almost no stamps for two, three months. And after three months, I said to myself, you know what, let's, let's have it run for six months. And that was just one of the initiatives that never took off, right? Let it die within six. 
And then a Veromoda marketing coordinator, she, uh, she put up a campaign, or you can call it a competition, for these stores and said, the Veromoda store that has the most stamps in one week, they win candy for the store staff. And it exploded. We went tenfold on stamps in that week. And we promised candy. I tell you, the money I spent on social campaigns, email campaigns, push campaigns, in-store banners, banner commercials online, it was, it was insane. And all I had to do was promise a little bit of candy. <laughs> so in the end, we now have, have uh, three stamp cards out there for three different countries, three different brands. We have 11 more in pipeline. What we see, one of the learnings is, in fact, that we have two to three times the average basket size. And is that because we have a stamp card? No. It's because our most loyal customers, the one that scores consistently 10 out of 10 on an NPS scale, they will love us for doing a stamp card. And that's the, guy, that's the people who spend 80% of, uh, of their clothing budget in our stores. And we add to that brand experience by doing a stamp. You could argue if we were Gucci or if we were Hugo Boss, would we do it, a stamp card? Of course not. But we are fast fashion. We are fashion for the masses. And this really works. And the critical part, our store owners really, really love the stamp card. However simple it is, and however short time it took. And one of the reasons is that it's usually flexible. They can say, you know what, take a picture of yourself on Instagram in the dressing room with one of our new styles and get two stamps. Get one stamp for a Facebook login. Get two stamps for an endorsement on Facebook. You can do anything. And for me, that turned the loyalty scheme thing around. We will still move towards a more structured loyalty scheme. But the Big Bang approach for loyalty, for me, died right there, at least in my line of business. OK. Those were three really, really simple, rudimentary things we did. And we have come to generation three or four on all of them now. But when we started out, it was the simplest thing. Click and collect, we did that with a book. They had to sign in the parcel when it arrived. They had to sign it out with the customer. No scans, no check, no nothing. And of course, it doesn't scale, but it works. Returns, we did that without any system integration. The stamp card, we did that simply using the app and a QR code. And all these three initiatives highly mattered when it comes to organizational readiness. So recapping or recrapping, depending on the eyes that see. So we did three things. Very, very simple things that changed the mindset in our organization massively. And I'm actually pretty sure that would, we would have had less impact the bigger we made it. Because we would not have had speed or simplicity or ability to take feedback along the way. And in essence, that is win small to win big. We won really, really small. And as a consequence, we're winning really, really big. As I said, we are on generation three or four. And that has only come because we won small in the beginning. And that leads to my final conclusion. In my view, the biggest innovation we have done in bestseller omnichannel is that we have changed the mindset of our organization, of our 3,000 stores, our 25 brands in 38 markets by really, really simple and rudimentary initiatives that we can build on and make scale. That's all I had for you. Thanks a lot, you guys. Any questions? Yeah, I'm just thinking about which name I should take today because I'm also I'm yeah, hello Søren. Hi Søren. I, I, I have the same problem with 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 the one. So I'm definitely going to steal your your cups because I've seen them all. Yeah. 
so you're talking about uh, the simple things as you say it. And I've just read that you probably have a, a very much harder thing coming in, which is tech. Yeah. And I've heard that your, your IT CIO is talking about changing the ERP system. Yeah. How's that going to affect uh, the omnichannel oh, tactics? Massively. So <sighs> changing an ERP system, especially in a business like ours, um, is what I try not to do with the current initiatives, right? I try really to keep it very simple, to make everything service enabled so that it's easy to integrate to. And I have a hand in the ERP, ERP but I also have to say that um, I'm hoping for a slow but very high quality rollout of an ERP and something that the organization can cope with because the minute you have um, issues with such an implementation, focus goes from anything else, right? And all we achieved on Omnichannel will be gone for a while if we can't order a product to a store, if we can't take payments, if we can't, that kind of stuff, right? So for me, go slow and high quality and get the organization into the ERP implementation that's critical because or else we'll just be uh, suffering all over the place. It sounds like uh, you're very data driven in, in everything that, that you do. Uh, but data for, for a lot of people can be very intimidating. So what's your advice? How do you, how do you make data more simple? Yeah. So um, I worked in a couple of retailers and one of the r real problems around, around um, being data driven in a retailer is that the recruitment pipeline, the talent pipeline in a retailer is very often through the stores. And on average, that is just a little bit lower education level. So data becomes something that you don't regularly look at. And when we do reporting, we do massive big reports with numbers. And when I take that to the store or even the owner of the store, I take three numbers and that's it. Maybe even one number. For instance, on, on upsell, uh, sorry, on returns, I take upsell. It's the only thing that matters. I don't do percentages. I do absolute figures because they can relate that to the end of day report on their cash register. So one to three numbers, absolute figures instead of ratios or percentages. For me, that's the first rule of uh, going to people that do not normally look at data. Southern. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. so happy you made it, and I hope you get well soon. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. A big Thank hand you. for Sarah.